Okay, so we have a differential equation um, where the right-hand side is some stuff with t's and y's in it. And if that right-hand side of the equation is what, then you know a solution exists. Continuous. Reasonable. Yeah, they were sort of um, paraphrasing the theorems. Yeah, reasonable or decent. Um, Yeah, reasonable and decent both mean sort of that both of the they mean that the function is continuous and its derivative is continuous. So yeah, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> all right, if the derivative of the right hand side is continuous, then there's a what kind of solution? Unique. No. The un the f uh, if you say if df dy is unique, that part's wrong. But single, I'll take for instead of as a synonym of unique. I mean, that is what he says is true. In the <laughs> yeah, there's always one derivative. It's not. <laughs> then that would just be a, a vacuous statement. <laughs> OK, so we're going to talk about um, existence and uniqueness of solutions. So these first two questions deal with just a simple polynomial. There's no differential equations here. I'm going to draw um, a parallel to these two problems with the existence and uniqueness theorem for differential equations. All right, so let's say we have this polynomial 2x to the fifth minus 10x plus 5 equals 0. It's a polynomial equation. I have no technology available. Um, and to help me find approximate solutions. How do I know that the solutions actually exist before I go through all the effort of trying to find x's that make that equation 0, right? How do I know that they exist? Oh, no, no, no. This has nothing to do with the reading. This is an old problem. This is like an algebra problem. So if I wanted to know. Are there places where this polynomial crosses the x-axis? That's really this question, right? Yeah. I, yeah, I could do trial and error and just start plugging things in. So I'm just going to show you what I found, right? I know that when I plug in negative 1, I get uh, 13. And when I plug in 1, I get negative 3. Okay. So what, what can I conclude here? It crosses the x-axis somewhere between negative 1 and 1, because that function goes from positive to negative, somewhere between negative 1 and 1. And the fact that lets me make that conclusion is that I know polynomials are continuous. I have to be able to draw this function without picking up my pencil. So here's negative 1, here's 1. f of negative 1 is 13. f of 1 is negative 3 not to scale. I have to be able to connect those with a line without picking up my pencil. So I know there's a 0 somewhere between negative 1 and 1. That backwards e means there exists. Yeah. yeah, the backward Z means there exists. Yeah. And then another common one you'll see in the reading is this symbol. And that means for all or for every. <laughs> All right, so I now know that there's a solution between negative 1 and 1. So I know that, that to be able to connect those two dots without picking up my pencil, I'm going to have to go through the x-axis. How do I know if I'm going to go through it more than once? Right? So I could just draw a simple connecting 
curve, right? It just goes through once. But I could also draw it like this. Right? And it could go through more than once. So in order to figure out if it goes through once or twice or three times, I could use a little calculus, right? And I could figure out um, where my maxes and mins are. I could figure out where is this function increasing, where is it decreasing, where its maxes, where its mins. So um, how do I figure out where a function is increasing and decreasing? I use the derivative, yeah. So I'm going to take my derivative. 10x to the fourth minus 10. I'm going to set it equal to zero. That will tell me places where um, I have potential maxes or mins. And I solve this thing and I get x is plus or minus 1. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> I already have values for 1 and negative 1. So then um, I'm going to use the second derivative test just because this is a polynomial and it's really easy to take the derivative. So f double prime is uh, 40x cubed. And then I'll plug in each of these x values, and that can tell me whether they're maxes or mins or neither, or inconclusive, right? So f double prime of negative 1. If I put a negative 1 in there, I get negative 40. So the second derivative tells me about concavity, right? When it's negative, it's concave down. When it's positive, it's concave up. So I know that at negative 1, my function is concave down, and it's a max or a min, right? So it either looks like this or it looks like this. But it's concave down, so it has to look like this. So that means a negative 1 is a max. All right, so I'm going to um, erase what I've got here draw a new picture of what I know that this looks like now. Negative 1 is 1. I know that negative 1 is 13, and that 1 is negative 3. And I know that this guy is a max. And then let's see what happens at 1. F double prime of 1 is positive 40, which means that it's concave up because it's positive. So this is a min. So I've got a min here. So when I connect these, will they will it cross the x-axis more than once? No, because it, to, to cross more than once, there would have to be a max or a min somewhere in between negative 1 and 1. And I know those are the only ones, because I did some calculus to figure it out. So I, can, I know that the graph of my function looks something like that. All right, so I used the function itself. I used f, my original function, to determine existence of a 0. And it was continuity that let me do that, right? The fact that the function f was continuous allowed me to conclude that there was a solution between negative 1 and 1. Original function gave me existence. But then I had to do some stuff with the derivative to determine whether or not that solution was unique. So this is an old algebra slash calculus problem. And there's an analogy to this with differential equations. To know if you have, if a solution exists to a differential equation, you have to have continuity of the right-hand side of the differential equation. To know if that solution is unique, you have to have continuity of the derivative. So you need to know some stuff about the function and its derivative. So it's somewhat analogous. All right, so now we're just going to sort of unpack what this theorem says. So the existence theorem says that there's a whole bunch of stuff with epsilons and a's and b's. I'm just going to draw a picture of what this theorem says. So um, t is between a and b. So I'll put a and b on the t-axis here. Here's my y-axis. And uh, y between c and d. So they're just giving you some rectangle in the plane to focus on. And then we're picking um, an initial condition, t naught, y naught, that's in the rectangle. So let's just put a t naught here and a y naught here. There's my initial condition. Why not? 
so that there exists some epsilon so that when t is between t naught minus epsilon and t naught plus epsilon, so we're putting a little like bubble around t naught. This is t naught plus epsilon. Epsilon, just typically in math, epsilon represents some small amount. Okay, so we just go some small amount to the right and some small amount to the left. Okay, so it says there exists some epsilon, some small amount where you go to the left and the right of t naught. Then there is a solution that solves the initial value problem. So if I sort of put some fences here, we know that at least on some small bubble around t naught, a solution exists. That's what the theorem says. Solution exists in at least this interval. It might not exist for all time, but but at least in that interval, there's some solution. That's what it says. Yeah. Not important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you have to start with T naught Y naught in the rectangle. Solution, sorry. S O L N. All right, so then my uniqueness theorem is just a very similar picture. Again, we're starting with some rectangle to focus on in which we place our initial condition, t naught, y naught. So I'll draw a picture of this one too. So I've got this rectangle A, B on the t axis and on the y axis, I've got C to D. And I put my initial condition within the rectangle. So that point uh, is my initial condition. And then same, same thing here. I've got sort of a, a window or a bubble around T naught, an epsilon bubble, which means just some small amount to the right and some small amount to the left. There is some epsilon, could be very small, but there is always some epsilon where this works. Um, where if y1 and y2 both satisfy the initial condition, then they're the same, right? So if I have a y1 and a y2 that are both supposedly solutions, then this is impossible. Yeah, if they if they ever agree in one spot, then they have to agree everywhere. They're just two potential solutions. They're yeah, so there any two solutions that have this same initial condition, right? They can't be they they can't be unique. Um, I mean, they can't be distinct. Okay, so both the existence and uniqueness theorems have hypotheses. That's the if part of an if-then statement is called the hypothesis. And theorems are almost always stated as if this, then you can conclude this, right? So the if part says that um, uh, the, the if part of both theorems is similar, but the uni uniqueness hypothesis is a little more restrictive about how nice the function has to be, right? Your book uses the word reasonable um, so we often can lump these two theorems into one theorem called existence and uniqueness that uses the more restrictive hypothesis. So to summarize, 
it says if f of t y is continuous, we can conclude existence, right? And if the partial of f with respect to y is continuous, we can conclude uniqueness, right? But if a derivative exists, the function had to have been continuous, right? Differentiable um, assumes con continuity, right? So if you show this part, if you've shown that, you've also shown the first thing, right? So we can kind of lump these together if we want. Okay, so that's all been like super theoretical. Let's use it a couple of times. Okay, so we have a, an initial value problem. I've got a differential equation with an initial value. I want to show that the right-hand side of my differential equation, 1 plus y squared, satisfies both hypotheses of the existence and the uniqueness theorem. So I have to show that f of ty, which is 1 plus y squared, is continuous. Right? We're not going to do any fancy proofs of continuity here. 1 plus y squared is a polynomial. Polynomials are always continuous. So this is yes, because 1 plus y squared is a polynomial. All right, and then the partial of f with respect to y. So I'm going to take the derivative of this thing with respect to y, and I get 2y. Is that continuous? Yes, same reason. It's a polynomial. Okay, so I know that my differential equation satisfies my hypotheses now. It's... Um, the right-hand side is continuous, and the partial with respect to y is continuous. So I know that there exists a solution, and that it is um, unique. All right, so I'm going to sketch the solution corresponding to the initial value y of 0 equals 0. So that's t0, y0. So I plot the point 0, 0, and I just follow the slope field. So it looks like it kind of curves up, something like, uh, looks like it gets, gets pretty steep, like maybe there's even a vertical asymptote there. Yeah, it's blowing up. All right, so let's solve this initial value problem. I think you might have actually solved this one in your homework if you've done it already. But um, we'll go through it just for practice. So dy dt is 1 plus y squared. I want all the y's on one side and all the t's on the other. So I'm going to divide both sides by 1 plus y squared and multiply both sides by dt and then integrate. All right, so what's the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus y squared? Arctan. Yeah, you don't have to. That's just one of the ones that we're supposed to know. We don't use it that often, so you might have forgotten. But the derivative of arctan is 1 over 1 plus y squared. So this says that arctan y equals the derivative, the antiderivative of dt would be t plus constant c. Technically, there's an arbitrary constant on both sides, but I just mushed them into one arbitrary constant on the right. And that's just a convention. We typically put the constant on the t side. All right, so if I want to solve this thing for y, how do I undo arctan tangent? Let's take the tangent of both sides. So I have y is the tangent of t plus some constant c. And then how do I figure out what my constant c is? Use the initial condition. Okay, so y of 0 is the tangent of c. 
which is zero. All right. Where is the tangent equal to zero? Where is the tangent function equal to zero? Let's think about it. Maybe we have to draw a unit circle if we don't know off the top of our heads. So tangent is sine over cosine or y over x. Yeah, zero, because this would be uh, one, zero. So zero divided by one would be zero. Also over here at pi, right? And then at two pi and at three pi and at four pi. So this is going to be plus or minus n pi, multiples of pi. So why do I have, why do I have so many constants? What? Blah. Which one do I pick? Zero. Why? It's the easiest. <laughs> I like that like chorus. Um, also, my initial condition is zero, zero. Um, and well, that actually that has nothing to do with it. Why do I pick zero? I can't remember. Yeah, it is because of the initial condition. If I put tangent of t plus pi, right, then um, y of 0 would still be 0, but I don't know. Let's just go with it for now, and I'll think about it after. So y of t is tangent t. There's my solution. Um, does that agree with my slope field picture? Does that look like tangent t? Yeah. So um, we see that the existence of a unique solution is not guaranteed for all t, right? So we had a solution through the initial condition, but it only exists between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 because there are asymptotes. All right, I'm going to go back and look at my notes in a minute to think about why I had to choose C equals zero. But for now, you guys can start your activities for, um, for lesson five, and then I'll, I'll let you know what I come up with.